What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fandom Talk. We're back with you guys again this week, coming off of some some great weekend with Gump City Con. We had a great time there. Coming off a a new, uh, what's the word for a milestone with going over 400 subscribers, and we're continuing to grow. We're literally, last time I checked, we're about 47 views away from 60,000. Um, so. We're, we're moving. We're moving. I'm going to check real quick to see where we are because that could have changed in the last two hours or so. All well, right. Congratulations on the subscribers while you're looking. That's awesome, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Drum roll, please. Oh, we're almost there. We're at 59,978. So we're still climbing. We should probably hit that by tomorrow. But I got some great people on the panel with me. I got some, some movie writers. I got some podcasters and a dog that might be barking in the background. So just listen out for that. I got my man Jeremy Branch and Steve Wise with me on the day. What's going on, gentlemen? Hey, what's up, guys? Glad to be back. Uh, happy to be doing a show again. We've got lots of news to, to go. Well, a couple stories, a lot to dive into because uh, – our topics are going to be pretty vast between the Stephen King movies and this movie pass thing going on, so I'm looking forward to it. Most definitely. How are you doing today, Steve? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me back on. No problem. We love having Steve on. Great guy, great talent, great, great, great. I love Steve. So let's get right into it. First thing we're going to talk about is Nick Fury is not going to be in Avengers 3 or 4. So that's Infinity War and whatever the title of the fourth movie is going to be that they're saying they're not going to name or put out there because it would spoil Avengers Infinity War. I'm fine with that. I'm also fine with Nick Fury not being in Infinity War. Reason being is because you already told me that Nick Fury is going to be in Captain Marvel, so I'm okay. But I want to get you guys thoughts. Steve, I'm going to start with you. What do you think about Nick Fury not being in Avengers 3 or 4 after with playing such a pivotal role in the creation of the Avengers? Well, it'll be interesting, first off, to see where the story goes. I mean, we know that they're going to be facing off against Thanos, but how exactly are they still considered the Avengers? Because right now they're all broken up. So <clears throat> story-wise, they all need to come back together again to fight the common enemy. And we don't really know where Nick Fury is or what he's doing right now. Um, but from a practical standpoint, there are so many characters that are going to be in that movie that eh, I don't think that trying to shoehorn in one more character just to have him in there uh, would work too well. So I'm okay with him not being in the film right now. Um, and, as you said, we are going to see him again in Captain Marvel, but the film takes place in the 90s, so it's a younger version of him. So we're still not going to be seeing what has happened to him since the last time we saw him. And you made a very critical point. What has he been doing since we saw him in Wonder Soldier? We know hopefully we'll find that out some way, somehow, Maybe that'll, they'll elude to that. Well, with it being set in the 90s, they could possibly elude to it, or it could be an end credit scene, or maybe he might be in an end credit scene in Avengers 3 or 4. Jeremy, what your, what's your take on this? Well, i I got to say I totally agree with the sentiment that the character should serve the story. Uh, if the character has a purpose in the story, then fantastic, but to just stick him in there as an obligatory uh, fan service thing, it's like, it, it, who cares? You know what I mean? Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, as an actor, he's going to be just fine. He's in every single franchise that ever, has ever existed, so he'll be fine. Um, it, it is interesting, uh, separate from the Infinity War thing, it's interesting that he's not going to be in the Black Pan Panther. Um, and, again, it, just because everybody else shows up um, in – you know, in that particular movie, I don't think it means, like, again, it seems like it would be out of obligation. Like, if, if Nick Fury doesn't have any business in Wakanda during the time frame that this, this you know, story takes place, then it's fine. You know, he's, there's been multiple, uh, you know, Marvel movies that he has not appeared in, and when he does show up, it just makes it all that much more better, you know? So it's it's very possible that, uh, you know, something could change between now and part four anyways. And like like Steve said, we got to kind of see where the next cards fall and see what's happening, you know, in this next immediate film before we can see that far ahead 
for all I know, Nick Fury may die in Captain Marvel. Well, he definitely won't die in Captain Marvel, but somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, too, that um, with Black Panther, I'm hoping that that story is self-contained and separate yes. from anything that the Avengers are doing. I know there's a high chance that Winter Soldier is going to be in it since, you know, we kind of left them over there. Um, but other than that connection, I, I hope that this, that's his own story and there's no need for Nick Fury or any of the other Avengers to just drop by for, you know, for no reason. And you, they yeah, already did say that we won't see Winter Soldier in Black Panther, so we're not we going to see Winter Soldier. Okay. Right. And I thought, and, and I personally believe, and of course they say we're not going to see him, but my thought would have been, even if he did not have a walking, talking, speaking role, that we might go back to that laboratory and see his body in space, you know, something, just something yeah. small like that, you know, just walking by, they're talking about something else, you know, like, oh, there goes Winter Soldier's body in space, you know. But they said we're not going to see him. But you guys, well, Jeremy, you made a great point about the character. Both, both of you all said the same thing in a sense. The character has to fit the story. Um, right. Again, Samuel Jackson did say he was pissed he wasn't in any of these movies. He did come he did. out and say that. <laughs> but, you know, the character has to fit the story. If there's no need for Sam Jackson to be in Wakanda, if there's no need for Sam Jackson to be there fighting Thanos or being a part of the conflict, then he does not have to be in the movie. He's not, not like he's hurting. you got a movie coming out Friday. You probably got another right. movie coming out after that, and another movie coming out after that. And speaking Can I of that, say real quick, I think that Nick Fury would be as effective in a fight against Thanos as Harley Quinn would be against Enchantress. <laughs> 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 Throwing that out there. <laughs> speaking speaking of that, I was listening to a podcast earlier today, and speaking of Samuel Jackson being a lot of movies, and this this is a a, a quick hitter topic I want to ask you guys about. They talked about actor or movie fatigue. You know, a lot of people say they see a lot of actors in the same movie that keep getting casted over and over and over. Do you all believe, and I'm going to start with Steve first, with him, with you being a, a movie director, creator, and film, a filmmaker, um, do you believe that sometimes we can see an overkill on actors? But the, the guy in the podcast, was actually the John Caffey podcast, he kind of broke down the question that the viewer had. He said he was tired of seeing people like Jennifer Lawrence and John Boyega in movies all the time, but he broke it down. Jennifer Lawrence is only in one movie this year. She was maybe in one last year and two the year before. But I can still understand the same sentiment of we see these people a lot. So, Steve, what do you think about actor fatigue, seeing a lot of actors in a lot of movies all the time? Well, okay, first off, you have the issue of – who sells tickets. And so if you have an actor that gets people to buy a movie ticket, then they're doing their job, and they're going to be cast in a lot of stuff. If you have an actor who is very popular and people just like to see him, you're going to see that actor quite a lot. Um, there is a danger of, of you know, <laughs> actor fatigue, if you will, where um, audiences – or specific individuals might get tired of seeing that person. But think about like someone like Michael Caine, who has been around for decades, and for the longest time he was in every movie that was made. I mean, he wouldn't turn down a, uh, an offer. And he's still going strong. You know, granted he's not headlining movies anymore, but he's still showing up in films, and he's you know, well into his 70s. Um, I don't think it's, it's a huge problem, but you also have another issue where you have actors like Samuel L. Jackson who is basically a personality. You know, you have character actors, which he can be a character actor. You know, there, there are times that he can disappear into a character and not just do himself. But by and large, when he shows up on screen, you're getting Samuel L. Jackson. And whether or not you, he works in that movie just all depends on, you know, basically what you think of him as a personality. Um, you know, actors like Schwarzenegger, for instance, while well, he, you know, took a break from acting because of his political career, but after a while, it's like, okay, do I want to see Schwarzenegger in a film? And if you've seen that so many times, you can grow, grow tired of it and want something different. 
Yeah, I, I can definitely agree with a lot of what you said, Steve. I mean, that <laughs> the first statement you said, in essence, that is the entire thing. Um, if they, if Jennifer Lawrence gets popular uh, for the Hunger Games, they're going to feature her more prominently in the next X Men movie that she's in, and that's just good business, you know. So I, I definitely. Um, understand why Tom Cruise keeps getting cast in the roles that he gets cast in. And I think that's an interesting point, what you said, Steve, about Samuel L. Jackson, because I feel like you could apply that same, those same characteristics to a lot of the big actors. Like when Chris mm-hmm. Pratt's in a movie, you know what you're going to get from Chris Pratt. When um, Samuel L. Jackson's a great example of it, but there are several actors, even, even maybe Tom Cruise, that, they get typecast as themselves and people like that persona and they get accustomed to seeing it. And, and so there's a familiarity there. And um, for a movie that may not have a bunch of character development, you throw in an actor that we have a history with and all of a sudden we're more invested in it. So there's a lot Absolutely. of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of like, um, I see both sides of it. I, I, I definitely understand the fatigue part of it, and I get the idea that Jennifer Lawrence isn't in every movie that comes up. I get that Chris Pratt isn't in every movie that comes out, but when the big pinball movies come out and they're having that conversation, it is the same five to ten names that show up every single time, and it would be hard to get a breakout performance if you're never giving these upcoming actors a chance to do it because the same people get the roles over and over again. But that's been the industry forever, you know, ever since yeah. freaking black and white film. And, and ever since then, there have been these popular people at Hollywood, and it's evolved. And so I see both sides of it. And I, I think that's important that people, you know, try to approach both sides of any issue, you know, uh, logically and just kind of think. Because when John Campia did break that down, it makes a lot of sense. These people aren't in as many movies as it seems like they are, but they tend to be in the ones that get the biggest marketing push behind them. So that's that's kind of where I'm at about it. Yeah, and again, that makes sense because they're the stars that people want to go see. And at some point, they're, the audience is going to be interested in someone else. Tom Cruise sure. has had an, an amazing career. I mean, you, you figure that he's in his mid-50s now, and he's still headlining action films. You know, there's not that many... 55-year-olds who can say that. You know, they, they generally yeah. move into the supporting roles as the parents of you know, the lead actor. Um, he, hasn't, he hasn't done that. And you know, at some point, his career will wind down and move into something different. Um, even Harrison Ford's career has moved into something different. Um, but as long as that movie star it has star power, they're going to get the major roles. Absolutely. Most definitely, most definitely. And you got you guys both made a comment, you know, in regards to that actor filling in that certain part of the movie. Like the movie can be dead, but if you know Samuel L. Jackson is going to be in it, you know you're going to get some type of off-the-wall comment, like Jeremy said, it's going to keep you invested. Like Samuel, Samuel L. Jackson is the voice of the person that that's sitting in the theater warning you about something in the movie. Like, for an example, he was in the King Kong movie. We about to go out here with these big gorillas and these big monsters, and you don't need to be bothered with them. Snakes on a plane is another example. Sure. You know, I'm tired of all these snakes on this plane. You know, <laughs> we said some other words, but we try to keep it PG on here. <laughs> but most definitely, most definitely, we're going to move on to our next topic, which is a topic Steve brought up today about all of the newest Stephen King novel adaptations to movie. Take it away, Steve. Uh, well, <laughs> the, the big one, of course, was the most recent uh, theatrical release, uh, The Dark Tower, which I have to admit I have not yet seen, so I can only comment in a hypothetical and basically from what other people have said about it. Um, but, you know, that by and large seems to have been a disappointment both at the, bo- um, at the box office and from fans of the series. Not that people across the board have hated it. You know, there's some people that did enjoy it, but it, it seems to have been a disappointment. Um, but we're seeing kind of a resurgence of King for some reason. Um, I'm not really quite sure why exactly, but we have several TV series, you know, we got Mr. Mercedes, uh, The Mist, and um, we've got a new 
series that's based on just his body of work called Castle Rock that's coming out, um, not to mention some TV movies like uh, Doris Claiborne that, that um, several people I know were, were in the film. Uh, so, and I know uh, we've got It that's coming up, and that, that's a major, major film also. So we've got some really intriguing projects that both on television and in, in theater that um, are being made from his works. Steve's entire library, like, you, Steve, you probably have every Stephen King novel. I, I, I think you might have told me that before. Is that right? Um, yes. Um, however, I'm actually missing Salem's lot because I loaned it to someone and I never got it back to him. <laughs> that sounds about right. I knew I knew you were uh, really into the author, and I can really only speak to a couple of his novels. I have not read The Dark Tower, but just how daunting of a task that would be in the first place to <laughs> turn even a two-and-a-half-hour movie, you know? So I've always thought the idea of making a television show was probably the way to go. Um, but then you get into all of this contractual hell because so many different studios have done these Stephen King movies, so who owns the rights to which characters and how are they able to use them in this story, which, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, The Dark Tower is just uh, a very meta culmination of all of the storytelling that Stephen King's done throughout the years. Mm, that- not exactly. Um, it, it does include some characters uh, from other books, um, specifically Salem's Lot and Insomnia. Uh, there, okay. there are characters that that appear in those books that do make their way into it. Um, and then, of course, Randall Flagg, who is the, you know, the villain in uh, The Stand. But the thing is that if you purchase the rights to a book and that character appears in that book, then you own the character in that book. You may not necessarily own the character that appears, let's say, in Salem's Lot if you don't own the rights to Salem's Lot. But you can use that character as written in the Dark Tower. So the right issues for characters is not going to be an issue. That I had no idea. That's that's good insight. And you know, um, I'm worried about it. I I don't I don't look at a project like Gerald's Game and be like, oh, this this could be really grim because the expectations aren't there. You know, a lot of the Netflix originals don't get a whole lot of uh, advertising behind them. I mean. People like us, we, we probably are aware, you know, a couple months before these things uh, get rolled out, but there's not the kind of hype machine behind a lot of these projects that there is behind it right now. And I fear that same trap of wanting more than what we could get out of an on-screen yeah. adaptation of this huge novel. And um, everything that I've seen promotional-wise I think looks awesome. I could not be more happy with the promotional stuff that I'm seeing, but at some point you just want to, you know, go blackout and not pay attention anymore. <laughs> I don't have all of the scares ruined for me before I see the movie. Now, have you so, read the book? No, no, I have not. Okay. Here, here's the big difference in, in my mind between The Dark Tower and It. The Dark Tower, because it is encompasses basically eight books, and it tells a greater mythology, and it does connect, you know, his whole universe basically together. Um, what they did was they decided to not adapt any of the in- individual books and have it basically set in an alternate universe. And so similar events happen, and the characters are similar, but they're not directly from what the books are. So it's okay. telling a different story that kind of alludes to events that happen in the book. So you're familiar with the, the scenes and the situation, the characters, but it's a new story. The failing, from what I understand, is that it's not a very interesting story that they tell. So, but with it, from what I've seen from the trailers, looks like they have painstakingly tried to capture the feel of the book. Now, with it, it tells two different stories. There's a story with the characters as kids, and it tells the story of them as adults. And in the book, the two stories are told basically simultaneously. It flips back and forth between the two storylines, so you don't know the ending of the story of them as kids until the very end of the book. 
Right. The movie is taking things from a different perspective, and it's kind of following the format from the, the miniseries from the 90s, which was two parts, in that part one was focused on the kids, part two was focused on the adults. That's what they're doing with the, with the movie. This is actually part one of two movies that are coming out, and part one will be about them as kids, part two will be as adults. And the, only, the major difference that I see is that they're changing the time period because of when the book was written in the 80s, as kids, they, the characters were set in 1960. The movie is setting it in 89, I believe. And so when we finally get to them as adults, it's going to be set in the present. Ah, so, that makes sense. So there is a, a time shift, that which, which does have an effect on the story. You know, when you translate a story from 1960 to 1989, there are going to be some differences that will be organic. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, but as long as they capture what the characters are, what the gist of the story is, and more importantly, the tone and the feel of the story, then they've done it right. Do you think that there's, um, do you think that there's something endlessly more compelling about kids in peril than there are adults in peril, and that even if the first one's fantastic, it's going to be hard to nail the second one? Well, that was one of the problems with the miniseries. Um, yes. The other, the other problem was that the adult characters were largely populated with TV actors. So you had Good John point. Ritter and Harry Anderson and you know people like that that you're used to seeing in sitcoms, and now they're in this horror movie, and we've already been invested in these characters as kids, and now we see them as adults. It's like, and eh, picture young <laughs> Seth Green as Harry Anderson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, the actors, the actors did a fine job. They, they, they were, you know, they did the characters really well. But it was just hard to buy into into the seriousness of the situation because of the casting. Sure. Where, as a, with a movie, if they do the casting well, um, it shouldn't be that big of a problem. Absolutely, that makes sense. And that was some great, great information. I mean, great debate and conversation on Stephen King. I haven't got a chance to see Dark Tower either, but I do plan to put it on my list. Before we move to our last topic, I'm going to give both of the gentlemen on this line today to talk about their latest project. So, Jeremy, what's going on over there at Big Terrible Production? Just working on the Movie Monsters series. I'm working on a Possession episode right now that's going to encompass everything from your Rosemary's Baby all the way up through, like, the taking of Deborah Logan or one of the last ones that came out and having a lot of fun with it. I, I started doing them weekly, but that, <laughs> that proved daunting. So now I'm doing them every other week and just kind of uh, taking my time through it, but it's been a lot of fun. And I got my first credit on IMDb, <laughs> which is pretty awesome, Steve. Really? What was the credit for? <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll let you, I'm not going to bury that lead, but it is really, really cool accomplishment, even though it's not a major credit or anything like that, just to, to be able to wake up and see yourself published on this, this news site that I go and visit regularly is a uh, it's pretty awesome feeling. But if you guys want to stay up to date with everything I've got going on, just check out Be Terrible Movies on YouTube. Most definitely. Steve Wise, what you got going on over there? I heard a little bird flew past my window this morning giving me some information. I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let you tell it. Well, since Jeremy didn't want to uh, pout his own chest, uh, I'll pout his chest for him. Uh, he ran sound uh, on location for a short film that I directed called Survey. And we are currently in post-production on it. Uh, we have a, um, a basically a director's cut of the edit done, which we don't have a picture lock yet. So, um, we, in fact, I'm kind of trying to coordinate with everybody involved to do some pickup shots, which basically means in the edit there's some shots that we need to go back and get that will help um, tell the story a little bit better than what we have. Um, this is very common in, in most films. They get the cut done and realize, eh, we need a close-up of this here, and we need something over here to, to kind of fill in the gap. So I've got about a dozen shots that I need to go back and film. It's just trying to get everybody back together again, uh, or at least the key, key people together is, is kind of a daunting task. Um, but we're hoping to get that done in mid-September. And once we have that all put together, then we can get the picture lock done and get the sound editing 
taken care of and music stored and color correction done and get it out there. So um, we still have a little bit of work to do on it, but it, it, it's coming together pretty well. Yeah, I was I was proud to be a part of it, and just from my personal experience, like he was owning it. I, the footage that I've seen so far is incredible. It looks great. Uh, Kevin Almadover, I'm not exactly sure if that's his name, but okay, he did I, it. And I have to apologize to Kevin because I always mess up his last name, but I believe Amaldivar. Amaldivar, uh, that's a name that I should know because he was he was incredible with the photography. Uh, the cast was great. A lot of the choreography is really good. It's just, it's unfortunate to hear that you got to do pickups, Steve, because doesn't that mean that the whole movie's ruined? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how that goes? We're, we're not doing reshoots. We're not doing a story. We're not bringing in another director <laughs> to finish the film. Um, right. A certain Star Wars film that we know of. Um, no, it's it just, like I said, it, this is typical. This is this is part of the process of filmmaking that you you plan, you spend a lot of time planning. You get on location, and what you shoot ends up being different than what you plan for because there's just so many different elements that are taken into consideration, like the time that you have on the set, uh, the the physical parameters of where you can set the camera. Um, how the actors respond on the day of shooting, um, whether or not there are planes flying overhead or sure. bulldozer that decides to start up in the you know in the distance that ruins the shot, uh, things like that that you have to kind of work around. And a lot of times you're shooting things and you realize, okay, I have on my shot list five shots here, and we just got it in one shot. Wow, great. So we move on, and then when we get to the editing room, we realize, okay, well, that one shot that we did, the actor is looking in one direction, and then from a different angle we got, he's looking in a different direction. So we need something to put the two together. We need something to cut away to that makes the edit work. And, and if yeah, we don't have something to cut away to, you know, maybe we cut to a close-up of his hand. Or, you know, in the case of what we need to do, like, you know, the sword swinging or, you know, the knife being knocked out of their hand or something that we got, but it's just in the edit, it'll work better if we add just this one little nuance to it. Most definitely, yeah. I think it's insightful to hear from you, somebody who actually does have the experience and can break it down in that way that, it's something that is taken into consideration. It's something that you guys expect that you are going to going to have to do afterwards because it's it's on this micro level that uh, people outside of, of filmmaking probably can't – they just don't have the experience to know. And prior to actually being on the set of survey, I was, I was aware generally of the process of filmmaking. I know what roles everybody, uh, you know, fulfills for the most part, but – how many people it takes to operate the camera to, to the way that – I mean, it was, it was just mind-blowing. It was such an eye-opening experience. So, yeah, again, really proud to be a part of it, and I can't wait for everybody to see it. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> I've shown the, the current edit to a few people, and they've given me some good feedback. So um, good. I think once it's in its final polished form, um, it'll, it'll go over pretty well. Good. Most definitely. Definitely proud of both you guys and every single thing that you do. Please follow these gentlemen all over social media and all over to interwebs as well. Our last topic today, which I believe is going to become a great debate, is about the company MoviePass, who's decided to lower their tickets or their prices per month to $10. Now, let's talk about how MoviePass works. For $10, you'll be able to go to a theater. You'll be able to watch one movie per day. You cannot watch the same movie. Like if you want to see Thor Ragnarok three times, you cannot. Um, you can only see regular movies, no 3D, no IMAX, nothing specialized. Um, and this is for every day of the month. You can go to the movies. You can pr practically see 30 movies in a whole month. Now, it's coming under some scrutiny because people like AMC and some of the other theaters are not wanting to do this because they feel like it will hurt customer morale. For an example, if this falls under, then people might blame the movie theater or the movie, the company that makes it and choose not to no longer go to that theater, which could, of course, 
hurt those theaters and hurt those companies. I personally, it's not something I'm interested in, and I'm going to tell you why. I have an AMC Premier card. Me paying $10 and then going to the movie out that I want to see each and every day throughout 30 days in a month, that doesn't earn me any points in my rewards card, which gives me free perks and things of that nature. So I feel like it will be a ben- uh, not a benefit for me. I'd rather just pay my amount to go see my movie, earn my points, and earn my rewards. But it might work for some people who, you know, feel like it's more cost feasible. So um, I don't think it's a good idea. I, I think it's kind of far-fetched. I never know this, knew, knew that this thing existed prior because apparently it had a different price before they decided to lower the price. But I want to hear what you all think. I'm going to start with you, Jim. What are your thoughts on this whole movie pass situation? Well, I should preface this by saying, I am not an I am not an economics major. I have no inside knowledge of the industry. I really don't know much about the whole entire uh, <clears throat> inner workings of the way that uh, these corporations work. Uh, now that that's out of the way, about two years ago, I subscribed to MoviePass. Um, I contacted a friend who worked at a local movie theater and asked him if they accepted him. He was instructed by his manager, no, they do not take any of those extra promotions. And I was like, but it's got a a credit card logo on it. It's a debit card. Why can't you take a debit card? We went back and forth, um, not out of spite or anger, but uh, confidentially, I called the corporate offices and I asked them about it. Is it okay for me to use this? And they're like, yeah, what happens is you get to the theater, you purchase the ticket on the app, the company movie pass prepays the money to the debit card, you go up to the cashier, and it comes out of that debit card, the exact same amount of money that the movie ticket would typically cost, we'll just say $10. Um, So that's great for the consumer. I mean, that sounds amazing. Even when I was paying $20 for it, it it went up to 30 and then I want to say they went up again, and that's when I couldn't really justify it as much anymore because I can safely say I'm going to go see one movie a week. Maybe I could see two movies a week, but there's other stuff going on, you know, so I can't dedicate every single day to it. Um, and so I think it's a good, I think it's a good business model. I do think that the price of $10 sounds too good to be true. Like in every sense of the word, it doesn't make sense how they could get it that low. But from what I understand, they're selling this information to third parties and to studios and things like that to make them aware of the, you know, the habits of of the moviegoers and their actual demographics. So I can see how that would be valuable to them, but that information is being compiled in tons of other places anyways. So you kind of got to weigh it out. You know, I, I know that, um, movie theaters make most of their profit off of the concession stands Thus why everything is so expensive at the concession stands. It's hard to keep prices down when the cost of the movies are going up. When people are making $120, $120 million, $150 million movies, you know, somebody's going to have to pay for that somewhere. So the theaters have to jack up their ticket prices, which they're not making much of profit on in the first place. So we get stuck with the high concession prices. A drink and a drink cup probably cost... 10 cents uh, when you break it down per unit and, you know, you're using concentrate, you're using carbonated water, you're using plastic or paper cups, very, very low cost. I'd imagine they probably mark that up somewhere around 8,000% to pass it on. So they're making money at the concession stands. That's where their, their actual profit comes from. So if 30% of the seats are empty on any night that's not an opening night, and those seats were not going to get filled otherwise, and you're putting people in those seats to purchase things at the concession stand, in my mind, it seems that there's validity to it. However, there's always another side of it. So I did start looking at, at the other perspective, and it might not be a sustainable business model. I can understand why it wouldn't be, but it seems like for the movie theater to go after this company that's about to save all movie fans tons and tons of money, it seems – it seems aggressive, and if they're worried about their reputation, this is every bit as damaging as uh, Movie Pass shutting down a couple months from now because Movie Pass and AMC aren't related, you know. 
so it's complicated, but that's that's kind of where that's what I've been thinking about and mulling around in my head. So I don't know. I'm open to hear any perspective, though. You know, Steve, what is your take on this? Well, first off, Jeremy, thank you for explaining that because I was trying to figure out what their business model was because I was thinking that somehow, you know, they the monthly fee was going to Movie Pass, and then they were splitting it between the theaters and the studios and distributors. and like, How would that work? But it right. kind of makes sense now to know that, okay, you're paying them a monthly fee, and then you go to the movie theater, and then they basically put the, the price of the ticket on the debit card, which you use to pay for the ticket. So, the, right. so from the perspective of the theater, they're just selling a movie ticket. And from the perspective of a distributor in a studio, they just had a sale for their movie. You know, they just had an audience member come in and, and buy a ticket for that. So they don't know how it's being paid for, the theater and the studios. They just know that someone purchased a ticket, and they are getting the exact same amount for that ticket as they would if you paid cash. So that makes perfect sense. From MoviePass's standpoint, what they're banking on is kind of a gym membership type of thing, and as a friend of mine pointed out. Um, so you pay ten dollars a month. How often are you actually going to go to the movies to use up that ten dollars a month? Let's say the average ticket price is ten dollars. All right, great. So if you go once a month, you're basically paying for the ticket. So from a consumer standpoint, you have to go to the movies 12 times a year to break even. If you go more than 12 times a year, you're doing good because now you're getting a free movie out of it. From MoviePass's standpoint, they're banking that for every person that goes a 13th time, there are two people or more that don't go the full 12 times. Absolutely. Okay, so that's how they're going to make money is from the general public, you might go 10 times a year. And it doesn't matter if you go once a month or, you know, five times a month for, you know, June and July. You, if you don't hit that 12 times, then you've given them money. They're making a profit. Now, from AMC standpoint, and then basically any theaters, I think that AMC is being dumb because for the exact reason that you pointed out, the movie theaters make their money off of concessions. They make, like, if they're lucky, they make 10 cents on the dollar for the ticket sales. Um, it, it's been known for um, some big movies like Star Wars, for instance, that theaters make zero dollars off ticket sales for the first several weeks. Yep. And then as you know, the longer the movie stays in the theater, the higher percentage of theater actually gets from the ticket sales. But of course, the lower number of ticket sales that they actually, you know, the lower number of tickets that they, they sell. So the, per, the percentage of ticket sales go up, but the actual amount of cash that they earn is not that much. So they're not making money off the ticket sales. The ticket sales are just to get bodies in the theater to buy popcorn and candy and drinks at a hugely inflated price. So for them to turn down movie pass where they're still getting the money from the from you know the ticket sales and the distributor's still getting you know the, the, the money from the ticket sales, it doesn't matter where that money is coming from. But if it's encouraging more people to actually go to the theater instead of waiting until the movie is, you know, comes out on, um, you know, on DVD or Redbox or whatever on you know, Netflix, then they're benefiting from it. So I don't see any logical reason why AMC would turn down Movie Pass because that just hurts them. Is it possible that there's something going on behind the scenes that we're just not aware of? As I mean, of course it is, but can you imagine that scenario? Because it seems like the only risk 
comes from MoviePass itself. If anybody was going to have an issue about this, because they're the ones that could potentially lose money, exactly like you said, the theaters aren't going to lose money, the studios aren't going to lose money, it's not like it's taking away from the, the industry in any, in any way. So what would be the, the ulterior motive, if you will, Steve? The, the only thing that I can see that might be a behind-the-scenes thing, and I think I read this in um, an article somewhere, is if MoviePass buys the ticket at a discounted price. If it buys okay. it at cost, if you will, as far as, you know, so if the movie theater is giving up its profit, uh, you know, whatever that profit may be, it may be 10 cents on a dollar. So, you know, for, for a $10 ticket, they're giving up a dollar in order to bring a person in who may buy concessions. Um, to me, that still seems like a good deal. You know, so, you know, and, and here again, I'm not an economic economics expert either, but it just seems to me that, hey, if they're giving free, basically, from their point of view, a free pass in order to get people to buy tickets or buy, buy concessions, that still benefits them in the long run. Absolutely. Malcolm, what, now that you've heard a little bit of different uh, perspective about it, how much do you think you would spend and get back in a month? How much do you think I will spend and get back in the month based on using my rewards card? With your rewards card, how much are you spending and how much would you say you're saving? Just to get a just to get the other side of the pie. And from my experience, if me and Victoria go to the movie just to put it out there, it's gonna be thirty five to forty dollars for each of us to go. We are rewards members as well. So we only spent I think thirteen dollars for that membership under your recommendation, by the way, and it's fantastic because, you know, there was no – we didn't know about this the other day. So there is an incentivization there, but do you think that it becomes a wash um, compared to getting the movie pass? It doesn't because you can earn points not just by going to movies. Sometimes they send you a message and say, hey, um, here's 500 points or okay. – we're, we're like for an example, if you go see the Logan Lucky tomorrow night, or they call it on their See It Thursdays, which, which is what they call it, they're going to give you an extra thousand points on top of the points you're already going to earn if you just come to see the movie. You only need five thousand points to earn five thousand dollars, well, well, to earn five dollars. I'm sorry, you only need five thousand points to earn five thousand rewards. So if you go see three movies, if two people go see three movies in a month, there's your five dollars back. Right. And, it, you know, and then it depends on – it also depends on what type of movie you're going to see. Uh, if you have a premiere card, a premiere membership at AMC, you get 100 points for every dollar you spend. So if I go to a movie where the ticket costs three ninety nine, four thirty nine, 439 or whatever after tax, that's one, two, three, four, 400 points. If I'm with another person, that's 800 points. Now, if I go see a movie that's seven ninety nine, and it comes up to 8 something after tax, that's 800 points per person. So that's, you know, that's 1,700 points right off the bat. If I go see two or three movies, and especially if I go with multiple people, I earn my rewards quicker. Sometimes I'm in line and, and people say, well, what, what you got there? I got a rewards card. Another thing is it gives you person benefits when it comes to snack, drinks and uh, soda and popcorn. So sometimes I'm in line and I see somebody ordering a medium. I say, hey, if you use my card right here, you can take your medium and upgrade to a large. I earn, right. six, I earn six or 700 points just by doing the person a favor. They get a large popcorn for a medium price, I get 700 points. There you so go. I was, yeah, there's I was even in line. There. Yeah, I was even in line one day and did that for somebody and got a $5 reward and bought myself a drink. Nice. Well, let me ask you something. Is it? The way that I'm understanding now, if you have this debit card that you go in and pay for, what's to stop you from using the movie card when you purchase a ticket? No matter, it doesn't matter if you pay with cash or your debit card, your own personal debit card, or the movie pass card. You're still buying the ticket, so you still should be able to use your um, uh, whatever the, the AMC card. You're right, and I, don't, and I don't question. I don't know if those correlate. So that's well, why my first mind I was against it. But it shouldn't matter because you're still purchasing the ticket. 
it's not. And it's possible that the reason why AMC is irritated about it is because of this new rewards program that they just now launched. I mean, that that could be reason why. I don't know exactly, but yeah, Steve, like if what you said holds water, then it's definitely worth getting the the movie pass and then getting that reward card. Because I'm going to be if if that does correlate, I'm going to be going to see the same movies. I pay that one ten dollars. And then when I purchase that ticket and the money's coming off that card and they ask me for my rewards card, it might correlate. Yeah. But I know because of the, the two different things, I didn't know if those matched up together. They possibly could, possibly just might as well could because if I go buy a ticket on Fandango, it asks, do you have a Stubbs reward or do you have a Regal Cinemas reward number? If you buy a ticket on movietickets.com, it asks for rewards numbers. So it very well might co- correlate together. And that's something I have to take a look into. Interesting um, topic, though, for sure. I, I think we'll be hearing plenty more about this over the next couple of weeks, so keep an eye out. Most definitely, most definitely. But, guys, we really, truly enjoyed you all today on this conversation. We got through some great deep talk topics. Guys, had some great conversation. I always love having you guys on. Jeremy, where can everybody find you? Check me out at Jeremy B. Terrible over on Twitter, Jeremy G. Branch on Facebook, Jeremy B. Terrible on Instagram. I should do the Twitter and Instagram together. It's it's Jeremy B. Terrible at Twitter and Instagram. We'll handle that in post. It was good talking to you guys, and I'll see you next week, everybody. And Mr. Steve Wise, where can everybody find you at? Um, you can find me on uh, my website, stephenjwise.com. It's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-J-W-I-S-E.com. And uh, on Twitter, Stephen J. Wise. Uh, and uh, find me on Facebook, uh, Stephen J. Wise author is my Facebook page uh, that you can like. Then I have a couple books that you can purchase from me, too. Do we have a survey? Do you have a survey fan page up, Steve? Uh, there is a survey fan page, as a matter of fact. Uh, look for Facebook slash survey film, S-U-R-V-I-F-I-L-M. Awesome. 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 Guys, still check those links out. But if you didn't know who we are, we're Fandos Anonymous. That's F A N D O M S A N O N Y M O U S. We're all over social media. Right here on YouTube. Please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell for future videos. Also, head over there to Facebook, where we're at the Facebook group, where we have discussions each and every single day, and hit the like on the Facebook fan page. Head over there to Instagram, where we're at Fandoms underscore Anonymous 17. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, and or ideas, please feel free to email me at familiesanonymous17 at gmail.com. we got a lot of stuff coming up on the Families Anonymous YouTube channel and the organization and the community as a whole. We're almost towards 60,000. Let's check right now. We might have hit it in this conversation. I doubt it, but you never know. Let's check for checking sake. And I've been refreshing we are, on a video the whole time. We are currently at 59,993. So we are literally seven views away from 60,000. So by the time I take a nice hot bath after the long day I've had doing the honeydew list, um, we should hit 60,000. So stay tuned for more videos coming from Fandoms Anonymous. And, guys, as I always say, if there is anything else, thanks for watching, and have a good one. Bye-bye.